Hey everybody, welcome to the final day of Magic Core Set 2019 set reviews on the Mana Leak. I'm John, as always, and today we're going to be going over the gold cards, the artifact cards, and the land cards. There's about as many as the previous set reviews with all of those put together. Of course, this is a limited set review. We're talking about draft, we're talking about sealed, but let's jump on into the first card. Up first is Aerial Engineer. Aerial Engineer is two white blue for a creature, human, artificer at uncommon. It's a two four. As long as you control an artifact, Aerial Engineer gets plus two plus zero and has flying. So this is a 2-4 for 4, which is pretty on par, and getting a 4-4 four, four flyer if you do have an artifact is an insane payoff. This is obviously the, uh, the signpost for blue-white. You're probably supposed to be in artifacts. Ultimately, I think this is a relatively high pick once you're heading towards either of those colors. I don't think it puts me specifically into blue-white. I don't think I open this and go, aha! Here's what I'm doing. I kind of want to be headed towards this. So I've got this at like a B minus. You're always going to ha be happy to have these if you are explicitly in blue white uh, artifacts. Up next is Arcades the Strategist. Arcades is one green, white, blue for a legendary creature, Elder Dragon at Mythic. It's a 3-5 with flying and vigilance. Whenever a creature with Defender enters the battlefield under your control, draw a card. Each creature you control with Defender assigns combat damage equal to its toughness rather than its power and can attack as though it didn't have a defender. There's four defenders in the whole set. This is not happening. This is just not happening. This is for jank, uh, standard brews, commander brews, whatever. You're not playing this in limited. Um, outside of it being a 3-5 flying vigilance creature, which is fine for four mana, that's actually not too awful, but you've got to get yourself into three colors. I don't think getting into three colors is going to be super hard, but it's also a cost, and I don't know that it's a cost that I want to pay for a 3-5 flyer. So I've got Arcades at like a D-. I, I don't think the deck exists to really take advantage of its abilities, and I don't think I want to hurt my mana base just to play a 3-5 Flying Vigilance. So I've got it at a D-, I don't plan on ever playing it. Up next is Brawl Bash Ogre. Brawl Bash Ogre is two black red for a creature Ogre Warrior at Uncommon. It's a 3-3 with Menace. Whenever Brawl Bash Ogre attacks, you may sacrifice another creature. If you do, Brawl Bash Ogre gets plus two, plus two until end of turn. This is the black red signpost Uncommon. You're supposed to be in a sacrificing deck. Um, ideally, my favorite black red sack deck would be stealing creatures and sacrificing them, but you can sack Goblin Tokens as well. The, the slight downside with Brawl Bash Ogre is if you do steal a creature, you don't get to attack with it. If you do want to sack it, you have to sack it before combat, but then you still get yourself a 5-5 a, a three, three, five, five Menace that turn. And it's a 3-3 three, three Menace on its own for 4 mana. So I'm pretty happy with this. I, I think it's totally fine. It doesn't quite pull me into that color combination, but once I'm even slightly headed there, I, I'm going to be pretty happy to have this. So B- minus, kind of like Aerial Engineer for Brawl Bash Ogre. Up next is Chromium the Mutable. Chromium the Mutable is four white, blue, black for legendary creature Elder Dragon at Mythic. She's a 7-7 seven, seven with Flash. This spell can't be countered, flying, and discard a card until under turn Chromium the Mutable becomes a human with base power toughness 1-1, one, one, loses all abilities, and gains hexproof. It can't be blocked this turn. Chromium seems great. Super weird. 7-7 seven, seven Flash Flyer is nuts for seven mana. It's costly, but it's nuts. Then, as long as you have a card in your hand, nothing is killing this because, ta-da, hexproof little human that also gets to get in for one. Chromium's awesome, like all the Elder Dragons that we'll talk about who are not Arcades. Um, you're you're going to pick it first pick. It's going to be fantastic. You're going to find that fixing, and you're going to splash for it. Not being in green, like some of the other dragons, slightly hurts Chromium, because you're not going to get some of the green fixing that's available, but there is enough in the artifacts, and plus there are dual lands that'll be kicking around. We'll talk about those as well. Uh, I, I think Chromium's a great first pick, and you do hurt your mana base to play Chromium. So, A- plus, I think, for Chromium, just because she's really, 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 really hard to kill. So A plus for Chromium. Up next is Draconic Disciple. Draconic Disciple is one red green for a creature human shaman at uncommon. It's a 2-2 tap, add one mana of any colors, pay seven, tap it, sack it, create a 5-5 five, five red dragon creature token with flying. Uh, this is great. This is a, a very solid card. It's a three mana mana dork, which is a little bit pricey, but it taps for whatever color you want, which is fantastic. It's a relevant body if you're not tapping it for mana. And later in the game where mana dorks suck, 
Ta-da, it's a 5-5 flyer. Um, yeah, this seems fantastic. I, I'm very happy to have this in every single red-green deck ever, and I'll hop into red-green if I see this, just because it's so powerful. Uh, flat out B for Draconic Disciple. Up next is Enigma Drake from Amon Cat. Enigma Drake is one blue red for a creature Drake at Uncommon. It's a star four. It's flying. Its power, the star, is equal to the number of instant and sorcery cards in your graveyard. So blue red signpost that you should be in. Spells matter. Of course, this is one of the decks that I'm most excited about alongside the uh, the black red sack deck. So I'm probably going to overrate this a little bit. But I've got it at a B because it's going to be, hopefully at least a 2-4 flyer without really much work at all in the blue-red spells deck, which is fantastic for three mana. And then if it does get bigger, it's just fantastic. So I've got Enigma Drake at a solid B. I'm going to jump into this if I see it and dive into that blue-red spells deck. Um, and that's maybe a little bit of bias talking. So B for Enigma Drake. Up next is Heroic Reinforcements. Heroic Reinforcements is two red-white for a sorcery at Uncommon. Create two 1-1 one, one white soldier creature tokens. Until end of turn, creatures you control have plus one, plus one, and gain haste. So those are two twos that can attack when they come down uh, for the first turn. You're playing this because you're in the go-wide red-white weenies strategy, and this will end games. This doesn't remotely make me want to go into that color pair, but once I'm there, preferably with the various creatures that support this deck, this will be a great pickup and one that no one else should want. I don't think anybody's splashing for heroic reinforcements, but just like Trumpet Blast, just like Inspiring Charge, I'm not taking this and going, aha, I'm going into this deck. I want to get this on the wheel. So I've got this at like a C plus. Obviously, it's great in that deck and will end games, but it should be a later pick. C plus for heroic reinforcements. Up next is the uh, the head of the set, Nicol Bolas the Ravager. Nicol Bolas the Ravager is one blue, black, red for a legendary creature, Elder Dragon at Mythic. He's a four four flyer, and when Nicol Bolas the Ravager enters the battlefield, each opponent discards a card. Pay four blue, black, red. Exile Nicol Bolas the Ravager, then return him to the battlefield transformed under his owner's control. Activate this ability only any time you could cast a sorcery. Don't try to do this at instant speed. Don't let your opponents do this at instant speed. He comes back as Nicol Bolas the Arisen, which is a legendary Planeswalker Bolas at Mythic. It's a seven loyalty Planeswalker, as Bolas always is. Plus two, draw two cards. Minus three, Nicol Bolas the Arisen deals 10 damage to target creature or planeswalker. Minus four, put target creature or planeswalker card from a graveyard onto the battlefield under your control. Minus 12, exile all but the bottom card of target player's library. So baby Bolas is totally fine. A little bit hard to cast. You're not in green, just like I talked about with uh, uh, Chromium. So you're not getting the uttermost possible fixing that you could, but there is still fixing available in this set, but still ever so slightly hard to cast, but it's a 4-4 flyer. That 4-4 flyer alone may probably end the game. And in fact, there's going to be a ton of situations where it's incorrect to flip, flip Nicol Bolas because you've already hit a couple times with him and then your opponent's just going to be dead on another hit or two. But if you do flip Bolas, the Planeswalker is basically impossible to beat. Seven loyalty is a huge start, and if he doesn't have to protect himself, he immediately jumps to nine. If he does have to protect himself, he kills literally anything up to and including Gigantosaurus for only minus three, so he can do it twice and not die. Then reanimate anything from anywhere is nuts, which I, I don't... Does Bolas reanimate people? That doesn't seem flavorfully correct anyways. Finally, if you want to win with Flash, you can plus him three times and then you know, mill your opponent uh, down to one card. That is stupidly powerful. And I think Bolas is going to play out really interesting. Unfortunately, being mythic and being a first pick for literally anybody at the table, you're probably not going to get to do this very much. But I think Bolas could be amazing on turn four and just be a 4-4 flyer and you probably don't really want to flip it. Or you top deck Bolas on turn six and you play him and flip him the next turn and then you're not going to lose there either. I think Bolas is amazing. I think he's just a flat out A+. Plus. Um, just just super good. A plus for Nicol Bolas the Ravager. Up next is Palladia Moors the Ruiner. Palladia Moors the Ruiner is three red, green, white for a legendary creature, Elder Dragon at Mythic. She's a 6 6 with flying, vigilance, and trample. Palladia Moors the Ruiner has hexproof if it hasn't been dealt damage yet. 
And then once it gets dealt damage, it no longer has Hexproof for the rest of the game. It's a 6-6 Flying Vigilance Trample. That's going to end the game in a couple of turns. Your opponent's just going to be dead. And you're basically guaranteed to get in that 6 damage because it's got Hexproof. At least until it does that 6 damage. Then all bets are off. But that's 6 damage. Uh, th this is just fantastic. You're in green, which means you have access to the maximum amount of possible color fixing. Um, so, so, you know, make sure that you're grabbing your mana lists and your dual lands and etc. Playing your Elvish Rejuvenators and whatnot. And uh, yeah, Palladium Wars is going to be fantastic. Solid, solid, solid A. Um, this is just going to end the game. And it can't be answered immediately. Up next is Poison Tip Archer. Poison Tip Archer is two black green for a creature elf archer at uncommon. It's a 2-3 with reach and death touch. And whenever another creature dies, period, not period, comma, actually, but any creature, not just yours, each opponent loses one life. Uh, yeah, this is solid. Uh, I, I think this signpost on commons a little bit less clear, but I think it's basically saying, oh, mid-range kill stuff uh yeah it, it's a solid card it's it's a two three reach death touch which means it's taken down the thopters it's taken down the little flyers the two two flyers it's got death touch which means your opponent's bears and lower are not attacking in and each time something dies it's pinging for one all in all a totally fine card i think it probably does slightly pull me into those colors the archetype as i said is going to be a little bit less on rails i think it's going to be more just kind of pick the good cards that go into this deck um but yeah i'd be pretty happy with this card i've got it at a b up next is psychic symbiont psychic symbiont is for blue black for a creature nightmare horror at uncommon it's a three three flyer when psychic symbiont enters the battlefield target opponent discards a card and you draw a card so this is the signpost on common that blue black heavily involves discarding, which I talked about a little bit in blue and in black, I think mostly in black, that I'm not super happy with that being the theme of the deck because as the game progresses, discarding is going to be basically worthless. And by the time this comes down, your opponent's somewhat likely to have an empty hand so that discard's not going to do anything luckily it does also draw a card and a 3-3 flyer that draws a card i'm kind of okay paying six mana for ultimately i think this is probably one of the weaker of the uh of the gold on commons i don't think that it pulls me into these colors so i am going to put it at I think a C plus B minus might be a little bit more accurate, but the six mana, the somewhat lower power and toughness than you would expect. I'm going to keep it at a C plus. Up next is Regal Bloodlord. Regal Bloodlord is three white black for a creature vampire soldier at uncommon. It's a two four flyer again. It's something that doesn't look like it's flying. Yes, it's got smoke trails, but at a quick glance, it's standing there. Anyways, art direction on flyers aside, it also says at the beginning of each end step, if you gained life this turn, create a 1-1 one, one black bat creature token with flying. Uh, it's a little overcosted for the stats, 5 mana for a 2-4, but it does fly, so we're probably just okay there. But if you are doing the black-white life gain matters deck, this is a cool little payoff. I'm not sure the 1-1 one, one flyer each turn is going to be that amazing, so it's not like this is a, a real payoff or anything. It's not a payoff where you're going, aha, the engine is made and you are dead in a couple of turns because they're just one ones right uh, I, I i would actually prefer if this ability was on the epicure of blood and the epicure of bloods doubling the ping or, or the life gain damage was on regal blood lord instead anyways feels kind of like a b minus as well i don't think i'm diving into this deck for this one so b minus for regal blood lord up next is Seder Enchanter. Seder Enchanter is one green white for a creature. Seder Druid at Uncommon. It's a 2 2. Whenever you cast an enchantment spell, draw a card. I am out on this card. It's a heavily costed bear for an ability that I generally don't want to trigger. I don't want to be playing a bunch of auras. Plus, you can't play a bunch of auras in Limited because then you're not playing enough creatures. So I, I don't think this has a home. Save it for your janky constructed builds or enchantress builds or something like that. But I, I don't care for Seder Enchanter. I, I think it's an F. I, I think it's a card that I just never, ever, ever, ever want to play because I'm never going to have a deck that has that many enchantments in it. Not outside of Theros, anyways. Our second last gold card is Skyrider Patrol. Skyrider Patrol is two green blue for a creature elf scout at uncommon. It's a 2-3 flyer. At the beginning of combat on your turn, you may pay green blue 
When you do, put a plus one plus one counter on another target creature you control, and that creature gains flying until end of turn. This is solid. It's a 2-3 flyer for four, which is not the best, but you can pay that green-blue each turn because you already cast this, presumably, so it's not like this is a, an ability that you maybe can't pay for. Uh, spreading counters amongst your team over the game will be amazing. All in all, this is a card that you'll be very happy with to be in green-blue. I think this does take me into the green-blue colors. It's just a good, solid card. Solid B for Skyrider Patrol. Our final gold card is our final Elder Dragon, Vivictus Asmati the Dire. Vivictus is 3 black, red, green for a legendary creature Elder Dragon at Mythic. It's a 6-6. Six, six. When Vivictus Asmati the Dire attacks for each player, that includes you and your opponent, choose target permanent that player controls. Those players sacrifice those permanents. Each player who sacrificed a permanent this way reveals the top card of their library, then puts it onto the battlefield if it's a permanent card. It's a 6-6 six, six flyer for 6. That's fantastic. It's three colors, so yada yada yada. Get your mana list, get your dual lands, get your fixing. You're in green, so you have slightly more access to fixing. Yada yada yada. The effect is also extremely good here. You get to force your opponent to sack... Hopefully their flying blocker is probably going to be your primary target, and then any good green creatures that they have on the ground, and turn it into something that may be better, may be worse. That's a slight downside, but... They're, they're potentially, probably most likely to hit a land. And then below that, if you hit a bomb of theirs, they're probably not going to have that many more bombs that they could potentially hit. And then you can sack one of your lands, if this is your top end and you don't really need those lands anymore, and maybe turn that land into an actual creature. So Vivictus looks amazing. I think it's another very easy first pick. I think it's fantastic. I think it's going to be an A-plus as well. So that's it for the gold cards. We're going to move on over to the artifacts, where we're probably just going to have a whole lot of Fs, because that's how the artifacts usually go. Up first is Amulet of Safekeeping. Amulet of Safekeeping is two generic mana for an artifact at rare. Whenever you become the target of a spell or ability an opponent controls, counter that spell or ability unless its controller pays one generic mana. Creature tokens get minus one minus zero this is pure sideboard and you'll probably just never want to sideboard it in anyways limited just doesn't have that many spells and abilities that target you creatures sure but not you and paying one more really isn't that big of a deal so the only real effect here is your is your opponent's creature tokens and yours as well be aware getting one less power which isn't really that great either so ultimately, I think this is just an F. It's a sideboard card that I don't even think ever comes out of the sideboard. Up next is Arcane Encyclopedia. Arcane Encyclopedia is three generic mana for an artifact and uncommon. Pay three generic mana, tap it, draw a card. This is Jam Day Tome, a card that used to be great and an amazing mana sink, except everything's cheaper. It costs three instead of four. The activation ability is three instead of four. I actually kind of expected Jam Aid Tome to be in this set. Getting just a flat out strictly better version is uh, pretty cool. I'm going to actively start out playing this card in my late game decks, kind of my blue black control decks, because the card advantage is huge and it's an amazing mana sink. Sinking your mana into drawing cards is really good. But if your plan is early attacks, things like that, don't touch this. Do not play it. I'm going to start this at a C plus. Uh, I'm hoping that this uh, set really is friendly to this card. C plus for Arcane Insight. Encyclopedia. Up next is Chaos Wand. Chaos Wand is three generic mana for an artifact at rare. Pay four generic mana and tap it. Target opponent exiles cards from the top of their library until they exile an instant or sorcery card. You may cast that card without paying its mana cost. Then put the exiled cards that weren't cast this way on the bottom of that library in a random order. Great big meh. Seven mana to hit a random instant or sorcery which may be an uncastable unusable counter spell or a combat trick that's not going to do me any work and maybe will be a removal not terribly excited by that remember that a typical deck will only have six or seven instants or sorceries and a lot of those are going to be those combat tricks and things that don't really matter just a great big myth for me i don't want to take a turn off to cast a random spell that's not magic that's hearthstone F for Chaos Wand. Up next is Crucible of Worlds. Crucible of Worlds is three generic mana for an artifact at Mythic. You may pay land cards from your graveyard. I think I said pay. Play land cards. Absolutely not. Absolutely unplayable. It is a, a, a V 
It is a V for value. You pick the card because it's valuable, but it's an actual just flat out F in limited. It has no home. Do not ever play this card. Up next is Desecrated Tomb. Desecrated Tomb is three generic mana for an artifact at rare. Whenever one or more creature cards leave your graveyard, create a 1-1 black bat creature token with flying. Also, just know, even if you set up some awesome graveyard eating engine, the heavy air quotes payoff for playing this card is you get a few 1-1s. They fly, I guess. Just leave this. Nope, it's jank constructed stuff. Another F in the artifacts for desecrated tome. tomb. Up next is Diamond Mare. Diamond Mare is two generic mana for an artifact creature horse, the last of the horse cycle. It's an uncommon 1-3. As Diamond Mare enters the battlefield, choose a color. Whenever you cast a spell of the chosen color, you gain one life. The artifact cycle that did this, um, Dragon's Claw, I think, was one of them. Uh, Throne of Bone was a really old one. Were unplayable. They, they were a waste in your limited decks. I believe we had Staff of the X Magus uh, a few sets ago as well. Unplayable. Making them into a 1-3 creature does not make them any more playable. It makes them easier to remove. That one damage isn't going to do anything. That three toughness is not going to block for very long. I've got Diamond Mare at, uh, surprise, an F as well. Up next is Dragon's Horde. Dragon's Horde is three generic mana for an artifact at rare. Whenever a dragon enters the battlefield into your control, put a gold counter on Dragon's Horde. Tap, remove a gold counter from Dragon's Horde, draw a card. Tap, add one mana of any color. So this is literally Manalith. It's three generic, tap it to add one mana of any color. But it's better than Manalith because if you are playing dragons, you're going to get to draw some gold or some uh, cards at some point with those gold counters. At its worst, it's the Manalith, which we'll talk about a little bit later, is going to be very important if you are in the dragons deck or you're splashing a splashable bomb. I've talked about this a few times. I'll talk about this more. I don't believe this is a three color set. You should not be playing three color decks. You should be playing two color decks, but you should be splashing for a bomb maybe two don't go wild with your mana bases but the things that are going to help you to splash are the mana lith the dragon's horde and the dual lands so this is like a c plus in a deck that is splashing for one of those bombs and it's uh much worse like a d in decks that aren't up next is Explosive Apparatus. Explosive Apparatus is one generic mana for an artifact at common. Pay three generic mana, tap it, and sack it. It deals two damage to any target. I like shock. I don't like four mana shock that my opponent sees coming. There's no... But it's an artifact, so it helps out the blue-white artifacts deck, right? Except I'm going to want to use this, which means it stops helping out the artifact deck. Explosive Apparatus is just aggressively mediocre. I've got it at like a D plus. If you're really hard up for artifacts, here you go. But yeah, I'm not I'm not happy with Explosive Apparatus. D plus. Up next is Field Creeper. Field Creeper is two generic mana for an artifact creature Scarecrow at common. It's a 2-1. It's just a piker. It's a piker that can go in any deck. I think the only deck that's going to want it is the blue-white blue, blue white artifacts deck because uh, it's a 2-1, which is probably okay in that deck, and it's an artifact, which is really going to help out. Every other deck is, is probably going to cut this uh, exactly as you would a piker, so C- in basically every deck and like a C in the blue-white artifacts deck. Up next is Fountain of Renewal. Fountain of Renewal is one generic mana for an artifact at Uncommon. At the beginning of your upkeep, you gain one life. Pay three and sacrifice it. Draw a card. This is aggressively mediocre as well. I don't care that it's one mana. It's still a card, and it's doing nothing for you. It's gaining a miserable, meaningless amount of life. And then someday... It draws a card, and you put four mana into that. Um, we're not playing the uh, the life gain card in white that draws you a card. We're not playing this card either. Even in blue-white artifacts, there's just there's other artifacts you can get. I know I'm giving a lot of Fs to the artifacts, but there's some you can get. And there's, there's some cards that make artifacts as well. Those are much better. Play them. F for Fountain of Renewal. Up next is Gargoyle Sentinel. Gargoyle Sentinel is three generic mana for an artifact creature, Gargoyle at Uncommon. It's a 3-3 Defender. Pay three until end of turn, Gargoyle Sentinel loses Defender and gains Flying. Gargoyle Sentinel's fine. It's fine. It's a 3-3 Defender for three, which is okay. That, that's going to block and kill an okay amount of the ground stuff. And then... 
when you've got time, when you've got mana, you can pay three and it goes to the skies, which, surprise, blue-white, in addition to being artifacts, is also, historically, and in this set as well, just like every set ever, the flying deck. So this guy's going to be right at home. I think Gargoyle Sentinel is actually totally fine in that blue-white uh, artifacts deck. It might even be upwards of a C plus, maybe just a C. If you're not in that deck, it kind of drops to a C minus. Up next is Gearsmith Guardian. Gearsmith Guardian is five generic mana for an artifact creature construct at, at common. It's a three five. Gearsmith Guardian gets plus two plus zero as long as you control a blue creature. It's uh, the literal reverse of the blue-white artifacts matter creatures. It's an artifact where blue matters creature. And to, for, for the payoff, for the payoff of, of building your deck properly, by which I mean just playing blue, you get yourself a 5-5 five, five for 5. That's it. No trample. Doesn't do anything. It uh, maybe ups your artifacts matter cards. Ultimately, I don't think this is all that good. If you are in the blue white artifacts deck, then this is probably like a C, I would say at best. If you're in a, a boring non artifacts blue deck, then it's probably more like a C minus or a D plus. And obviously, if you're playing it as a three five, it's like a D minus. Up next is Magistrate Scepter. Magistrate Scepter is three generic mana for an artifact at rare. Pay four, tap it, put a charge counter on it. That's it. Tap it, remove three charge counters from it. Take an extra turn after this one. People love extra turns, and they are almost never good. They are almost always bad. Paying 15 mana and three turns to get an extra turn is not something that I want to be doing. So Magistrate Scepter, surprise, F. Don't play this card. Up next is Manalith. Manalith is three generic mana for an artifact at common tap, add one mana of any color. See, it's Dragon Tord, just without any other fun stuff going on. This is totally fine. If you are in a two color deck splashing a third color, this is gonna be your best friend. You're gonna want one of these guaranteed, especially if it's something bomby. A two-color deck, I don't think you really play this. Perhaps if you're like red-green ramp, this is kind of okay, but it's still not the best ramp. Uh, but, you know, you could give it a go. Ultimately, this is like a C plus if you do have one of those splashable bombs. Otherwise, it's more of a, uh, a C minus D plus. Up next is Marauder's Axe. Marauder's Axe is two generic mana for an artifact equipment at common. Equipped creature gets plus two plus zero. Equip cost of two. I don't super care for this. Plus two, plus zero for four mana for the first time just isn't me. I'm not interested. I'm not even going to play this in the Artifacts Matter deck. There's better choices. There's not many, but there's better choices than a Marauder's Act. Axe. Equipment has to do something, and it has to cost real cheap. And uh, this doesn't quite get me there, especially not with a toughness boost. Up next is Meteor Golem. Meteor Golem is seven generic mana for an artifact creature Golem at Uncommon. It's a 3-3. When Meteor Golem enters the battlefield, destroy target non-land permanent on opponent controls. This is fine. It's certainly not Ravenous Chupacabra. Seven mana is a whole lot more than four mana, but it still is removal. It still kills everything and actually will even kill enchantments or artifacts or something that's not a creature if you are having some problems with them. And it leaves behind a 3-3 three ma three, three body. 7 mana is definitely a real cost. You need to make certain that you're getting there. That means you are not playing this in your red uh, white decks. You're not playing it in your red blue decks probably. Maybe in your red green decks because you're ramping. Hopefully in your blue black decks because you're going to the late game. Um, but I don't think you should be picking this terribly highly just because it does go technically into any deck. I think you need to already be planning to get to the late game. You need to be picking other removal instead of this. Obviously, combos really well with things like mirror image and uh, metamorphic alteration and stuff like that. But ultimately, I think this is around like a C plus. It's not going to get a premium grade. It's not going to get premium removal, and I'm never going to pick it super highly just because seven mana is a lot. So C plus for Meteor Golem. Up next is an oldie. A goodie that I like, except not unlimited. Millstone. Millstone is two generic mana for an artifact that uncommon. Pay two, tap it, target player puts the top two cards of their library into their graveyard. This is excruciatingly slow. I mean, like, even the art is showing how slow it is. The millstone is slowly grinding down this mountain face thing. Um, yeah, it doesn't do anything remotely fast enough at all. 
I'm hoping the format is slightly slow. It's not going to be millstone slow. The amount of time, the amount of mana that you need to actually mill someone out with a millstone is ludicrous. This is another F. You should not be playing this card. Yes, I'm going to draft Patient Rebuilding, which boy are people yelling at me about, and Psychic Corrosion end this someday on stream, and we'll try to make it work, but I don't recommend that you try. <laughs> Up next is Rogue's Gloves. Rogue's Gloves is two generic mana for an artifact equipment at Uncommon. Whenever equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, you may draw a card. Equip cost of two. Apparently this was an M15. And I have literal absolute zero memory of it. So either it was amazing and I just never got past it. Or I never played it and scrubbed it from my memory. It was so bad. I'm going to go towards the latter. A four mana investment and I need to make sure that my opponent's getting hit by my creature. I'd rather play another creature that I apparently can guarantee that is going to hit my cre my opponent. Um, yeah, th there's just there's so little going on here. Drawing a card is great, but this requires just way too many hoops for me to jump through. So I'm not playing this. I've got it at like a D. Up next is Sigiled Sword of Valeran. Sigiled Sol Sword of Valeran is three generic mana for an artifact equipment at rare. Equipped creature gets plus two plus zero, has vigilance, and is a knight in addition to its other types. Whenever equipped creature attacks, create a 2-2 white knight creature token with vigilance that's attacking. Equip three generic mana. It's a power boost. It's a toughness boost. It adds vigilance. It makes a 2-2. This sword's good. It's great. It goes in basically every single deck that's playing creatures. Easy first pick. It's not quite as insane as Black Blade or anything, but it'll be very, very, very annoying. Absolutely solid B. Here's a great artifact. Play this one. Unfortunately, it's rare, so you're not guaranteed to get it. Up next is Sky Scanner. Sky Scanner is three generic mana for an artifact creature, Thopter at common. It's a 1 1 flyer, and when it enters the battlefield, draw yourself a card. It's an Elvish Visionary that costs one more mana. It flies, and it can go in any, every deck. And I think that's fine. I don't think it's good. I think good is a strong word here, but I think it's totally and utterly fine. It's able to attack, which Visionary usually could not do, and uh, obviously it's a slam dunk in those Artifacts Matter deck. This is the artifact that you want to grab yourself a couple of copies of for the blue-white deck. All in all, I think it's a C+. I think it's a low C+, but it is a C+. I'm not going to load up on these in every deck, and I'm not going to pick them very highly, but they're here. Our second last artifact is Suspicious Bookcase. Suspicious Bookcase is two generic mana for an artifact creature wallet on common. It's an 0-4 with Defender. Pay three and tap it. Target creature can't be blocked this turn. I never much cared for Rogue's Passage, and this is a vulnerable Rogue's Passage that can easily be killed on, like, a land. While I certainly will lose to this, it's just never a card that I can usually find a spot for. Aggro decks would just prefer to have more creatures or a way to remove a creature. Control decks would want more removal. Mid-range decks are better than this card. I'm going to put this at, like, a D, because maybe you could slide it in if you find yourself in, like, a board stall matchup out of the sideboard. But Suspicious Bookcase just doesn't quite do what I want to do. It looks like it's the best friend of an aggro deck, but the best friend of an aggro deck is more aggro, not an 04 wall. Our final artifact is Transmogrifying Wand. Transmogrifying Wand is three generic mana for an artifact at rare. Transmogrifying Wand enters the battlefield with three charge counters on it. Pay one, tap it, remove a charge counter from Transmogrifying Wand. Destroy target creature. Its controller creates a 2-4 white ox creature token. Activate this ability only any time you could cast a sorcery. Kind of mad this destroys the creature. It should be exiling it because you kill it and then it can come back even though the ox is still there. That doesn't make any sense. This should really be exiling. Anyways, this is a good card. This is really good. This is removal on a stick, sort of. People were jumping on me that I didn't mention that metamorph metamorphic alterations can be used as quote-unquote removal. You can put it on your opponent's bomb and turn it into their 1-1 sky scanner. I didn't really comment on that because I think that is a massive desperation play. I think that's going to be the incorrect play in a huge number of cases because it's not removal. You're still just giving them a, a creature, except it's just a, a less good creature that is, you know, somewhat close to a fog or it's like putting a, it's like putting minus two minus zero on a creature that's a four four and is still going to be able to attack very well. So that's why I didn't really mention it there for metamorphic alterations. Yes, a couple of times it will be amazing. This card is somewhat similar because you are 
taking a good creature and you're turning it into a 2-4, which is not a great creature. Pillarfield Ox is not a card that we've ever really been super excited by. But boy, does it block really well. So this is obviously going to be, at best, killing bombs and killing flyers. And so I ultimately don't know what grade this should be. It's going to be a decent grade. It's going to be somewhere between, like, the, I think, C plus and, like, B range. And I think it might entirely be deck dependent. If your deck has no problems with two fours, your deck is big and stompy. You got four fours, five fives. If your deck is flying, you've got two two flyers, three three flyers, whatever. And two fours are going to be no problem. This card's going to be amazing. It's three removals. But if your deck is red, white weenies, you're never getting through a two four. And suddenly you're in this situation, which I worry about using metamorphic alterations as removal, where you are turning down the clock, but not in any way, shape, or form stopping the clock. So ultimately, I think Transmogrifying Wand is going to be super deck dependent, and it's really going to range from, I think, actually more like a C- minus upwards of a B. So try it out. I'm going to try it out. I think there's going to be decks that are going to love it. I think there's going to be decks that won't touch it. All right, so with the artifacts out of the way, we're on to the lands, and then we're done. Up first, we have 10 cards. We have Cinder Barrens, Forsaken Sanctuary, Fowl Orchard, Highland Lake, Meandering River, Stone Quarry, Submerged Boneyard, Timber Gorge, Tranquil Expanse, and Woodland Stream. All of these lands are at common. They enter the battlefield tapped, and they tap for one of two colors, black or red, white or black, etc. Now, these lands actually aren't going to be in a common slot. These are going to be in the basic land slot. However, not every basic land slot. Only 5 out of 12 packs will have one of these cards in the basic land slot. Otherwise, you're getting a basic land or maybe a Nicol Bolas uh, uh, checklist card. Mathematically, what that does is it makes these feel a little bit more rare than any given on common. Now, these lands are great to have in this set. It does not make this a two or a three color set. As I've talked about a, a few times, I'm going to talk more in the primer next week. I don't think you should be playing three colors. I think you should be playing two colors. And if you find yourself a great bomb, splash it. If you find yourself an elder dragon that shares your two colors, if you find yourself a bane fire and you're in white blue, if you find yourself uh, an amazing splashable card, splash it. But I think diving into three colors is going to be wrong. If you found that bomb, if you're looking to splash, go ahead, pick one of these up relatively early as soon as you know that you need them. Uh, but I don't think you pick them too highly before that because this is going to be a default two color uh, uh, draft environment. So these are all kind of like a C plus when you really want them and they're more like a C minus when you don't. Uh, if you're in the two colors, you can play one of these and it's okay as long as you're not trying to be super duper aggressive because then a tap land would be a slight problem. So uh, C plus, C minus. You should know when you need them. Our non-dual land, our first rare non-dual land, is Detection Tower. Detection Tower is a land at rare, tap, add colorless, or pay one generic and tap it. Until end of turn, your opponents and creatures at your opponent's control with hexproof can be the targets of spells and abilities you control as though they didn't have hexproof. Which is a weird wording, but they don't lose hexproof. So in a commander game, for example, a multiplayer game, your other players can't target that player's stuff only you can so they don't quite lose hexproof but as far as we're concerned for one-on-one -on -one, they lose hexproof now how many hexproof creatures are there in the set there's one that's always hexproof that's the green horse there's chromium when she turns into a human and there is uh palladium moors uh before she hits you for the first time and that's it the horse i'm pretty confident you can deal with in combat relatively easy Chromium is going to be a pain in the butt to deal with at all, but if you are up against her, the like once or twice that you ever will be, maybe side this in. And Palladium Moors is going to be a pretty big problem to deal with as well, but I mean, she loses Hexproof after that first hit, so as long as you don't die in the first hit, it doesn't matter. So this is uh, pretty close to an F. It's like a D minus just because I think that Chromium matchup is going to be a place where this maybe could come in. But D minus for Detection Tower. You should probably just never pick this and uh, pick it up last pick if you can. 
Up next is Reliquary Tower. Reliquary Tower is a landed on common. You have no maximum hand size. Tap out a colorless mana. This is uh, an F. It's absolutely not going to do anything. You are lucky to have seven cards in your hand, typically in limited. Having more is basically unheard of. So there's no reason for me to ever play a Reliquary Tower ever. You're just hurting your mana base. Colorless mana doesn't matter. Straight F for Reliquary Tower. You should never pick it. You should never play it. And our final card for the entire set is Rupture Spire. Rupture Spire is a landed on common. It enters the battlefield tapped. When it does enter the battlefield, you have to sacrifice it unless you pay one generic mana. So you can't play this on turn one. If you do, you lose it. Play it on turn two and tap your first land drop. What does it do? Well, tap, add one mana of any color. So this is, again, fantastic mana fixing. I would absolutely love to have a Rupture Spire in every single deck where I'm playing an Elder Dragon or where I'm splashing for a Banefire or splashing for one or two cards. Uh, I'll repeat it one last time. You should be playing two colors, and if you get your hands on something super powerful, splash it but don't dive into three colors. Ultimately, this is like a C plus in those decks that want it and it's unplayable in the decks that don't want it. There's no reason for you to play this in a two color deck. You're just hurting your mana base. You're slowing yourself down. So don't just play this willy nilly, but once you got yourself one of those splashable bombs, be very happy that you've got a rupture spire. So much so that I would actually pick this in the first few picks in pack two or pack three after I've picked myself up something that I know I'm gonna splash. So that's going to wrap it up for Core Set 19 entirely. It looks like a, a fun set. It's a core set. I've seen people complaining this set looks weak. It looks boring. That's a core set. If you haven't been around for a core set before, that's what a core set is like. They are supposed to be a little bit more boring. They get new players into the game, and new players are vitally important to the game. So welcome new players. At the pre-release, if you see a new player, talk to them. Ask them how they found the game. Ask them how they're enjoying it. Help them out. Be nice to them. We need players to keep the game thriving and growing. Plus, it's kind of cool to be nice to people. Be nice to people. Anyways, I'm excited to get back to playing it. We're, of course, going to have a ton of M19 content. We will have pre-release recaps. My pre-releases are going to be a little bit weird because I'm not going to be doing a massive pre-release like I do usually. There was a scheduling error, and uh, our local game store did not get the big room, so we're just going to be doing 16-person uh, events. But I will be doing two of those, and I'll have recaps of those. I will have, of course, draft content the second it's available on MTGO and Arena, streaming, etc. And next Thursday, I will do a draft draft primer where I'll talk about the archetypes of the format. I'll go over the combat tricks you should be aware of and any sort of uh, uh, ideas that I have going into the pre-release. So let me know what you think of the set as the whole, what you're excited for. Uh, again, with these cards here, which ones do you think I was wrong on? Which was I right on? Talk with me, talk amongst yourselves. But if you do have any questions, comments, or suggestions, you can find me on Twitter at the Mana League. That's L-E-E-K, like the vegetable, not the card. You can find me at facebook.com slash Mana League, twitch.tv slash Mana League, and patreon.com slash Mana League. If you want to help keep the channel going there, you can work your way towards getting a Mana Leak playmat sent to you anywhere in the world, get entered for uh, uh, the crack pack cards that I open, actually getting sent those cards if you want them, and uh, you can just help the channel keep going. There's a Discord that a bunch of us hang out in. You get access to that, access to the notes uh, with all the card grades, etc. So check it out. If you like the content, click that thumbs up button. Click subscribe if you want to see more. And if you do have questions, comments, or suggestions, let me know. Otherwise, see you all next time.